which is now. Okay. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And uh, thanks for starting uh, a little earlier than normal. I, I have another thing to get to um, in an hour. But I will be talking about the foundation of a matroid. I'm going to share my screen. And feel free to interrupt anytime you like with questions. Um, yeah, otherwise, I'll. Uh, I'll give only a very brief introduction to matroids and recall some things so I can get into some new uh, material, but I'm happy to explain if something is not clear. So, um, hold on. Yeah. Okay. So everything I'm talking about here is joint work with Oliver uh, Lorscheid. And, um, let me start out by talking about uh, a few sample theorems so that you have a little bit of an idea where I'm headed. Um, in many cases, what we're doing is reproving or slightly strengthening known theorems about representations of matroids. Um, but I think the proofs we, we give are interesting in that they um, have very uh, kind of conceptual, almost categorical flavor to them, whereas the previous arguments tend to be case analysis of, you know, many different cases. And, you know, I think we're seeing something conceptually new in the reason behind some of these theorems. And we can also cook up new theorems, but I think the interest is more in the method than the results so far. But anyway, here's the kind of things we're after. So here's a theorem due to Jeff Whittle. Um, so a matroid is representable. And again, I'll actually define these terms later, but I assume many of you have some idea what this means already over the finite fields GF4 and GF5, if and only if. So that sort of means there's some matrix with entries in the field of four elements, a different matrix with entries in the field of five elements, whose underlying matroid is, is the given one. If and only if it's representable by a real matrix, whose um, maximal minors, or the determinants of the maximal minors, if you like, are all plus or minus a power of the golden ratio. So um, it's a funny kind of thing that, um, can relate what happens over different finite fields to something that happens over the real numbers. And, um, you know, I would like to explain some structures that help us see why things like this are true and what's really going on here. Another one is a theorem due to Lee and Scobie, which says that uh, a matroid is ternary, which means representable over the field of three elements and orientable, which means it can be given the structure of an oriented matroid to something to do with real numbers and signs, um, if and only if it's uh, representable by a real matrix Whose maximal minors uh, are uh, plus or minus a power of two. So one of the things we do in our work is we kind of give a unified proof that can prove both of these theorems at the same time. 
whereas previously the techniques used to prove these sorts of things were quite different. Um, but you see the flavor is the same of these results. So it seems reasonable to expect that there could be a, some kind of uniform approach here. And then one more result, and then I'll get on with some definitions. So this is something that Lorscheid and I proved that I guess hadn't been observed before. We actually have an infinite number of theorems like this, but I'll just pick some particular numbers to make it more uh, understandable. Um, so a matroid is representable over field of three elements, field of five elements, and field of 11 elements, if and only if, um, it is representable over GF3 and GF29. Okay, so, you know, I guess the question is what, what kind of techniques could we use to prove things like this? How can we explain the apparently random numerology here? And, um, uh, yeah, what what ap other applications might such thing uh, techniques have? Okay, so now let me talk about um, just a little background about matroids and their representations before I get into the main topic, which is going to be uh, what I call the what we call the foundation of a matroid. And the foundation of a matroid is an algebraic invariant you can attach to a matroid, uh, which is kind of a universal object in the sense of category theory. It governs, um, it actually represents a certain functor, meaning that it governs the representations of the matroid over all um, so-called pastures, but in particular over fields like we've seen in the previous slide. Um, so this one algebraic invariant captures all representations over all fields and other structures as well. And it's computable and uh, we can classify foundations of certain kinds of matroids and that's where I'm headed here. But first let's take it a little bit slow, but hopefully not so slow that it's boring. And uh, I'll tell you what a matroid is. So a matroid is a finite set E. and a non-empty collection of subsets of E. Uh, let me call it script B. Uh, these will be called the bases of the matroid. You can think of them as analogous to bases of the vector space or as analogous to spanning trees in a graph. Um, those are actually both special cases in a certain sense. And um, so it's a collection of subsets that has a certain exchange property, the Steinitz exchange property. So what is that? For any two bases, B and B prime, and any element in one but not the other, uh, you should be able to exchange it out. So there's a little b prime in the other symmetric difference, such that if you um, throw in this new element b prime and take away the element little b, you again get a basis. And um, okay, it's hard to appreciate this if you haven't seen it before. So I will just um, hope that you've seen something like this before and have a little intuition. Um, but I'll give some examples in a moment. It's a fact that this condition, this exchange relation implies that any two bases have the same cardinality this is actually kind of the idea of how you prove that um, dimension of a vector space is well-defined. Um, and uh, so the rank of, of the matroid M is the size of any basis. Now matroids famously can be described by many different equivalent conditions, 
I'm not going to you know, state five equivalent definitions because that would just get boring and redundant for, for many of you. Um, but I will just say that another axiomatization of the notion of matroid is through concept of an independent set, which generalizes linear independence in vector spaces. And a basis then becomes a maximal independent set. Um, but we won't really need the notion of independence. If we do, we can define it now as um, a set as independent if it's contained in some basis. So what are some examples of structures like this? Well, one of the main examples is uh, matroids attached to matrices. So if A is a matrix over some field K, Uh, we can let E be the set of columns of A. And for ease of notation, I'll probably identify this with the set one through N. And um, now we let B be the maximal linearly independent sets of columns. So if your matrix has rank R, then you look at all sets of R columns, which are linearly independent. And that collection of subsets of the set of columns will form the bases of a matroid. Right. And matroids of this form are called representable over K. And if I need notation for this, I'll call it the corresponding matroid M of A. All right, so let's give one quick example. If K is the field of two elements and A has columns consisting of all non-zero um, binary vectors with three coordinates, Right. So this matrix over the field of two elements um, has a corresponding matroid. It's rank three. Uh, and um, the matroid is known as the Fano matroid. And, you know, to get some intuition, it's often nice to draw pictures. So one of the other things about matroids is that um, they, they really correspond to geometric properties of configurations of points, lines, planes, et cetera. And sometimes it's possible to draw that in an enlightening way. Of course, it depends on the rank and the size of the, the set. But I mean, in this case, we could draw a nice picture, which you've probably seen. And this picture somehow captures the incidences between the points of the projective plane over the field of two elements, as well as the lines uh, in that space. And um, so the seven lines in this picture, so the points are the elements of the set E, and the seven lines here are the non-bases of size three. Right, so because those lines represent linear dependencies. And so the, if you take three points that don't lie on a common line in this projective plane, then those are independent and form a basis. Okay, so, um, and I mean, this rep matroid is representable over the field of two elements, but not over any field of characteristic different from two, as it turns out. Um, Right. Now, in general, uh, we'll be interested in like how the 
representation or how the matroid depends on the choice of a matrix. So of course this matrix, well, in this case, maybe it is unique because the field only has two elements. So you don't have a lot of choices, but in general, right? Matrix representations are not unique. Um, one, one obvious thing you could say is that in general, um, M of A depends, the matroid associated to A depends only on the row space of A. Um, that's sort of easy to check. Um, and so, uh, so the, a representable matroid of rank R say is actually determined by um, an R dimensional subspace W. W of K to the R, oh, sorry, K to the N. So in other words, um, uh, by a point of the Grassmannian of R dimensional subspaces of a fixed N dimensional space. So the row space of that matrix A gives us a three dimensional vector space inside of uh, K to the seven. And um, this turns out to be a really important observation that there's some kind of connection between points of the Grassmannian and matroids. And I wanna explore this a little more, right? So you're probably all familiar with um, Grassmannians, but just in case, I will remind you that Grassmannian GRN is a, uh, can be embedded in projective space. It's a projective algebraic variety. And um, it's worth reminding ourselves how that embedding works. Um, it's given by the, the Plucher coordinates, the Plucher equations. So what are the Pl Plucher coordinates of a subspace W? Again, say R dimensional. Um, well, I'll call them delta i. i runs through the r uh, size r subsets of our set E. And um, so this is a point of projective n space over k, where capital N is the number of such subsets. And um, what is the coordinate delta i? It's just the determinant of the matrix A sub I um, right where A sub I means the R by R minor corresponding to the subset capital I. And um, yeah, it's a fact that First of all, that this depends only on the subspace W. So A is just a matrix representing W, that the row space of A is W. And this does not depend on the choice of a matrix A. And um, you can actually characterize which vectors in projective capital N space come from subspaces. They're exactly the, the points of projective space that satisfy the Plucher equations. So um, the image is cut out by the Plucher equations, image of this embedding. Okay, now um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna write out the um, full Plucher relations, just because it involves a lot of notation. But uh, the most important ones for us are the three term Plucher relations or equations. Uh, and these have the following form. So um, 
you fix a subset J of size R minus two. And then four more points. Which are disjoint from from uh, J. And then so I'm defining here the three term fluke relations. And they look like this. So you have say X J A B X J C D minus X J A C X J B D plus X J A D X J B C is equal to zero. Where X sub I is the coordinate corresponding to capital I. So, um, No, it's not true that the three term Fluker relations define the, the ideal of the Grossmannian in a scheme theoretic sense. And in fact, they don't even necessarily cut it out set theoretically, except when R is two. But, um, uh, but there is the nice fact. So here's a theorem. I have no idea who this is due to. It's kind of a folklore thing. Um, so again, K here is a field. The statement is that a point delta in projective end space uh, satisfies all the Pluca relations, i.e. it corresponds to a subspace W of rank R. If and only if it satisfies the three term fluke relations, and the support of delta is a matroid, meaning the set of bases of some matroid. So support are is the subset consisting of non-zero coordinates, right? So this already hints that there's a real connection between sort of Grassmannians and matroids that is more substantial than just a vague analogy. Um, and so we're actually gonna make use of this theorem later, uh, but I just want you to remember now that um, as long as you have a point that's matroidal in the sense that its support forms the base, satisfies that exchange axiom, then the uh, Grassmannian is, is defined by the three term Pluca equations. Okay. Um, now I want to just quickly define representations of matroids and then we'll get into the, the new part of this talk. So, um, so a point delta in projective end space over K with support um, equal to some matroid M uh, will be called a representation of M. So matroid theorists would probably talk about matrices as representations, but from my point of view, it's better to think of a representation as corresponding to sort of the row space of that matrix, not the matrix itself. This reduces the number of choices that we have to make. <clears throat> and then we need an equivalence relation between representations. So two representations, delta and delta prime, are called equivalent if, well, um, I guess let me just write it down. If there's a constant C, or let's say a function from E to K star such that one Pluker uh, 
vector is rescaled by some constants that depend only on um, the corresponding element of capital E. So let, now they wrote that down, let me tell you what it really means. This essentially corresponds to rescaling the column, each column of the matrix A by some scalar, but it, you don't have to use the same scalar for each column. Because if you take a matrix A and it gives you some matroid, and if you rescale the columns, it obviously doesn't change which columns are linearly independent of from which other ones, right? Just by multiplying by a scalar. So um, you get the same matroid, but you get a different representation of it. So we'll call two such representations equivalent. Or if you're geometrically minded, you can think of equivalent representations as corresponding to points that lie in the same torus orbit on of the Grassmannian. So you you have a torus action on the on the Grassmannian, and um, uh, these correspond to the torus orbits. Okay, so. What we want to do now is talk about representations of matroids over algebraic structures that are more general than fields. And the reason will become quite clear later, but I'll just say that fields are not an adequate category to represent most matroids. For example, most matroids are not representable over any field. That's a theorem of Peter Nelson asymptotically the proportion of matroids that are representable over some fields is 0%. That's one reason that fields are not good enough. Another reason is that fields don't really have categorical operations that we'll want to use, like uh, tensor products, for example. So um, we actually need a larger algebraic category. And this category will be called um, pastures. So my next topic is to tell you what a pasture is. These are generalized fields. We'll be able to talk about matroid representations over pastures and to give some applications of this general concept. So any questions about matroids before I continue? All right, good. So let me tell you what a pasture is then. <clears throat> Uh, so intuitively, before I, um, you know, write down anything official, let me just tell you that it's like a field. We're going to give up one property, basically, which is we're going to give up the property that addition is defined by a binary relation. In other words, we won't think of... Um, a pasture is having an addition operation where you take two things and spits out a third thing called their sum. Rather, we'll have some collection of additive relations which are either true or false. And they'll satisfy weaker axioms than what happens when, you, when your notion of an additive relation comes from a binary relation. Um, but it's rather than talking so abstractly, it's kind of better to give some examples, I think. So let's talk about the so-called Krasner hyperfield. So um, as a set, it just has two elements, zero and one, and it has the usual multiplication on it. Um, so we'll never be doing anything very interesting with multiplication. It's always addition that we'll be monkeying with. And in this case, what are the additive relations? Um, well, we have zero plus anything is that thing. That'll be an axiom for pasture. So that has to always be there. Um, we have uh, one plus one is equal to zero. And we also have one plus one is equal to one. Okay. So, you know, this already shows you that addition doesn't come from a binary relation in this case, because one plus one is not well-defined. 
but that it's not going to bother us. We'll just say that, okay, one plus one equals zero is true, and one plus one equals one is also true. All right. Um, so if you like, you could say that addition is multiply defined, uh, but it's actually a bit of a pain to talk about things like associativity of multiply defined operations. And so it's actually better from my point of view to just think of it this way. And um, another example to keep in mind is called the regular partial field. And our notation for it is F1 plus or minus because this is secretly related to geometry over the field of one element, but don't really wanna tell you about that right now. So as a set, this is just zero, one and negative one, again, with the usual multiplication. Uh, and what are the additive relations? So in this case, well, again, as I told you, we always have zero plus X equals X. In this case, we have one plus negative one is equal to zero. And uh, that's it. Well, I mean, addition's commutative. So minus one plus one is also equal to zero. But those are all the additive relations. So in particular, there's no additive relation of the form one plus one equals something. And so before we had two relations of the form one plus one equals something. And here we have no relations of that form. So if you like, you could say that addition is partially defined here. That's why it's called a partial field. Uh, you just leave one plus one and negative one plus negative one undefined in this case. Um, yeah, so somehow those are the two prototypes of how pastures differ from fields. Addition can either be multiply defined or partially defined, or both, or neither. Okay. So let me actually give you a definition now. So a pasture is um, a, uh, let me say, pointed monoid. Uh, F comma zero. So that's a, a multiplicative monoid F together with a multiplicatively absorbing element zero. So zero times anything is zero. That's what I mean by pointed monoid, such that when you remove that element zero, you get, um, that's the definition, uh, is an abelian group. together with an involution x goes to minus x on f and a set which I'll call the null set of symmetric triples of elements of f such that, and we don't have many axioms. So first of all, um, the zero triple should be in the null set and one zero zero should not be in the null set. So I should tell you that secretly we think of X, Y, Z being in this null set as meaning that X plus Y plus Z is zero. So imagine, so X, Y, Z null, is sort of shorthand for saying x plus y plus z is equal to zero, which is the same as saying that sort of x plus y is minus z, where z is that involution. Um, the second property is that uh, if you multiply something in the null set by a scalar, you, it's again null. And finally, that zero x, y is null. Well, that should be if and only if x plus y is zero. And the axiom is that that means x is minus y, where minus is again, this involution. 
So it's a little abstract, but I mean, I'm just trying to show you that it's, um, the axioms are very simple. And it's almost like the structure of a field, except that uh, our additive relations are quite general. Okay. Just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so, asso so associativity doesn't make any sense, you mean, I mean. This yeah, in right. There's no associativity axiom here for addition. That's right. Okay. And in this definition, is an abelian group under multiplication, you mean? Yes. Yes. Okay. Together. Okay. With this properties. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I should say times here. Right. Okay. So, of course, there's also a, a, a one element. There's also a multiplicative identity element called one. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, so again, I think it's easier to understand this through examples. So every field is a pasture in a kind of obvious way where you, again, say that X, Y, Z is null if and only if their sum is zero. And that clearly satisfies all the axioms that I wrote down. Um, but you have other kinds of examples. Uh, maybe in the interest of time, well, no, I think it's worth giving this example. So suppose K is a field and G is a subgroup of the multiplicative group of K. Then um, you can look at K mod G. So you're taking a field modulo a multiplicative subgroup. And this is a, a pasture where you say that x, y, z is null if and only if the corresponding cosets add to zero. So in other words, there exist a, b, and c in the group G such that ax plus by plus cz is equal to zero in k. And, um, you know, as a special case of that, for example, um, you could look at, for example, the real numbers modulo the positive reals. And then you get a pasture called the sine hyperfield. And um, so it has the property that, uh, well, it reflects the arithmetic of signs basically. So um, in this sort of more additive no notation, one plus one plus one is not zero because if you add three positive things together, you can never get zero, but one plus one plus negative one is zero because you can rescale those ones and minus ones to other positive, other real numbers with the same sign to make that sum equal to zero. Um, and then the third example is a partial field. So if you have a subgroup of let's say R is a commutative ring and you have a subgroup of the group of units which contains negative one, then you can just take the elements of G together with zero and this forms a, a pasture. And pastures of this form are called partial fields. And here X, Y, Z is null if and only if x plus y plus z is zero in the ambient ring R. So the idea here is you're restricting, you're using addition in, a, in some ring R, but you're restricting your elements to belong to some multiplicative subgroup of R. And if sort of the sum of two elements of G doesn't again belong to G, then you just kind of leave that on the sum undefined. That's the intuition. Okay, so 
those are the main examples. And um, the thing is that pastures form a nice category. Well, so first of all, you can define morphisms, right? So a morphism or homomorphism, if you like, is just a map phi, uh, which uh, is a multiplicative homomorphism and sends the null set of one thing to the null set of the other. And I guess it preserves zero, one, and negative one, if that doesn't already follow from what I said. Um, so just structure preserving maps. Um, but what's nice here is you have um, products and tensor products. In fact, arbitrary limits and co-limits in this category, which is not true for fields, for example, nor is it true for hyperfields or partial fields by themselves. But pastures have all these operations. You also have an initial object, which is the regular partial field that I introduced before. So that maps to every pasture in a unique way. And you have a final object, which is the Krasner hyperfield that I introduced before. Everything maps uniquely to the Krasner hyperfield. So these are nice facts that will come up again later. And I claim they're useful for matroid theory. Okay. So now let's talk about representations of matroids over pastures. So suppose F is a pasture, M is a matroid of rank R on some set E, which maybe will be one through N. Um, so definition, a representation of M over F is a point of projective N space over F that is easily seen to make sense. I mean, you can define projective space over pasture the same way as you do over fields, uh, satisfying the three-term Kluge relations and having support M. Now, what do I mean by satisfying these equations? Well, I mean, again, if you interpret the three-term Pluck relations by definition have three terms in them. So they're of the form, you know, A plus B plus C equals zero. And so just reinterpret that as saying that it's, so instead of A, B, so instead of A plus B plus C is zero, you replace that by A, B, C is in the null set of the pasture F. And if you're over a field, that is equivalent. That's how the null set's defined. So this generalizes the notion of representations over fields. Okay. Um, and this has some nice properties. So for example, I don't really want to get into this, but for example, um, uh, a representation of um, a matroid over the sine hyperfield that we just talked about is the same thing as an orientation of M in the sense of oriented matroid theory. So you can actually define oriented matroids using this notion of representations of matroids over pastures. Um, Okay, but I don't want to get too in, into that because I just want to say that uh, we can define equivalence of relation of representations as before. So same definition I gave before. And uh, here's the main theorem that motivates everything I've been talking about. <clears throat> 
So the functor that sends a pasture f to the set of f representations of m. So we're fixing a matroid m as on the previous slide. Functor sending a pasture f to the set of f representations of m modulo equivalence is representable by a pasture f sub m, uh, which we call the foundation of m. But so if you're not familiar with the language of representable functors, this means that um, the set, let, so let's give this a name, let's call this chi m of f. That's the set of all representations mod equivalents. So that set is equal to homomorphisms from the foundation into f and in a kind of functorial way. So, all right, you might say, so what? But this is good. I mean, we can understand representations of matroids now just as homomorphisms from some concrete algebraic object. And so I claim that just knowing that this functor is representable already gives you some nice theorems. So for example, so here's some applications. Uh, so there's a theorem of Tut, just one of the, I think, first really deep and interesting theorems in matroid theory. So a matroid is what's called regular. One definition of that would be that it's representable over the integers by a unimodular matrix, right? So all the maximal minors, in fact, equivalently, all of the um, minors, square minors have determinant zero plus or minus one. Okay. Matroid is regular, that's the definition, if and only if it's representable over every field. And actually, if and only if it's representable over just the field of two elements and the field of three elements. So Tut's original proof of this was quite difficult. Um, used his so-called homotopy theorem, which I'll mention again later if I have time, but um, then there was a proof, much more elementary proof given by Girards, but you know, that proof is very nice, but it's kind of like a bunch of matrix computations. So it's some um, pivoting and various things with matrices. But we can give a proof that's almost pure thought of this result. So here's a proof um, in our language. So um, first of all, just by kind of definition, a matroid is regular if and only if it's representable over the pasture F1 plus or minus this so-called regular partial field. Um, I mean, yeah, because somehow I define matroid representations in terms of determinants of maximal minors. So to say they all belong to zero, one, or minus one is basically the same as being representable over this pasture here. So that's the first ingredient. So that's just kind of by definition, basically. Then um, in the category of pastures, so I, I use like GFP and FP interchangeably, sorry about that. If you take the product of the field of two elements and the field of three elements, it's easy to check that this is the regular partial field. This is just a small computation. Um, so in the category of pastures. And so finally, just by the definition of a product in a category, if I take hom from the foundation into a product, 
it's the product of the Hans. And if you put those two things together, uh, we're done, right? Because matroid is representable over F1 plus or minus if and only if there's a homomorphism from the foundation into F1 plus or minus. And if you just combine these facts, you get Tut's theorem. So somehow Tut's theorem from this point of view is, is almost trivial. Whereas, as I said, the original proof was quite difficult. So there's something interesting going on here. <clears throat> Now we've extended this kind of argument to other structures. So um, uh, similarly, um, oops, sorry, I just lost my iPad for a second. Maybe it's a good time to see if there's any questions while I fix my, my iPad. We still see the iPad, if that's any help. Yeah, I think it just, uh, the cover, I think, I think I might have just broken my cover. Um, okay, oh. have to figure out how to write. All right, I I'll deal with it. Um, okay, so um, similarly, uh, but much more difficult, Uh, we have, we can prove this least Gobi theorem that I mentioned earlier. And actually we get a generalized version of this theorem, which probably could be checked from their original proof, but it wasn't stated in this way and be a little bit of a hassle to prove this using the original method. But we get a very short proof, um, namely that, uh, so a matroid is um, ternary and orientable if and only if um, well the maximal minors uh, so it's, it's representable over the reals and the maximal minors belong to um, plus or minus uh, power of two. Okay, so let's try to understand why this is true. And I see I'm almost out of time. So, I mean, let me just finish summarizing how this works and then um, I'll be done. So, um, so here's a sketch of the proof. So first of all, there's something called the dyadic partial field. Um, which is, um, it consists basically of all powers of two inside of the real numbers, uh, if you like, or just inside of uh, Q. But so this is that subgroup G that contains minus one, and this is my commutative ring R um, from before in the definition of a partial field. So the dyadic partial field exactly captures these powers of two and their negatives. And um, uh, so we wanna look at F3, the field of three elements times the sine hyperfield because matroids representable over that will be things that are both ternary and orientable. And um, it would be nice if that were equal to the dyadic partial field, then we'd be done by the argument before. But this is actually not correct. I mean, for example, the dyadic partial field is actually infinite. And the product of these two finite things is finite. So clearly that's not right. Um, so instead, what, what we have to do here is prove a, what we call a lift theorem. So let me just finish by talking about lift theorems. So we want to say every matroid representable over certain pastures are automatically representable over somehow certain uh, other pastures. And um, I'll just say that the 
This follows from the following um, theorem. Um, so let tau be the set of pastures, uh, foundations of ternary matroids. So you look at all matroids representable over GF3 and their foundations. We have an explicit description of this, but I don't have time to give it to you. But this is quite a concrete thing. We have a classification of such foundations. And then the theorem is that the inclusion functor uh, from this, these special foundations into all pastures uh, has a right adjoint, uh, which we call the lift map. So it's given any pasture, there's some way to cook up a another pasture that is the foundation of a ternary matroid and has some universal property. I don't have time to uh, write down exactly what that means, but, um, uh, but here's how you use this to prove the Lee Scobie theorem. So I sort of interrupted the proof to state that theorem and now here's the rest of the proof. Um, so if you have a map um, from the foundation of M of some matroid M into the sine hyperfield, right? So you have a matroid that's orientable and let's say M is ternary as well. Then this will automatically lift to the lift of uh, S. So there exists a unique map like this. That's the universal property of um, right adjoints. So, um, so if you have a matroid that's ternary and orientable, then the foundation actually maps to the lift of the sine hyperfield. And the lift of the sine hyperfield um, is actually uh, the dyadic partial field. So it's not that the product of F3 and S is this dyadic partial field that explains that theorem of Lee and Scobie, but the fact that this lift construction gives you this. And um, so there's many other similar applications like the ones I stated on the first, um, first slide. But now you see the, it's all essentially like some kind of category theoretic constructions, which are not so frequent in this subject of matroid theory. So I think it's interesting that we can blend this Grotendieck style mathematics with really concrete statements about matroid representations. And I'll stop there. All right. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, do you still have time for more yeah, I have a few questions? If the, okay, so if there are some questions, now is the time to ask. I have a question. I'm Sandra Kingin. Um, I'm a matroid theorist. So I was wondering what um, you would what book or papers you would recommend for somebody who's whose specialty is matroid theory and needs to learn about the Grassmannian ah, okay. and pastures. Um, yeah. So I mean, there's a bunch of places, but nothing. No one source has everything I talked about. Uh, I think the there's a paper, um, let's see. Maybe if you send me an email, I'll be happy to send you a few references. I think there's not a concise answer, unfortunately, but um, actually I, I do have a blog where I wrote a couple blog posts about this kind of stuff and that might be one place to start. But otherwise send me an email and I'll, I'll send you some references. Thank you, I'll do that. That was a very nice talk, thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? I think I heard some other question in the background before, but I'm not sure. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. I see. Hey, Matt, so first of all, can you share your slides? Oh yeah, let me do that again. No, 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 I, I mean, 
share them oh, as a oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> um, um, yes, I'll be happy to uh, uh, send my slides yeah, uh, to Patrick, I guess. Well, it's easiest if you send them to me, and I guess anybody who was here who wants a slide, just drop me an email and I'll. Uh, the second question is I mean, how, how much of algebraic geometry can you do over passages? Yeah, that's something I've been um, looking at lately. And um, well, I mean, it's, it's a very difficult question because a lot of things are much harder, but some things do work. And so we're trying to see how far we can push it. Um, so I'll, I'll give you just one idea of the kinds of things we can do. I mean, well, I'll say two things. One is, um, I mean, this definitely suggests that like the Grassmannian should be thought of as an object that's defined over like this F1 plus or minus um, pasture rather than as somehow, you know, just, just an algebraic variety. So that works well. And so we, we construct a category of geometric objects that in which the Grassmannian makes sense. And you can look at its points over any pasture. Um, and then you can do this for other mod, certain other kinds of moduli spaces as well. And we're looking at what other moduli spaces kind of fit nicely into this category, into this construction. So that's one thing you can do. So we have a paper called Moduli Spaces of Matroids where we talk about that. The other thing is, um, I think is really interesting and very hard is to try to do intersection theory on these kind of schemes over pastures. Um, and so there's one baby case of this. I mean, cause then you could get some really interesting enumerative results potentially. Um, and I think some of these results, Kareem, that follow from, you know, things related to what you're doing about chow rings, like some of, there's some results in the literature that seem to indicate that there should be a more general kind of algebraic structure there than, um, yeah, like these, the recent, I'm trying to remember who all the authors were, Hunter Spink and Dennis Tsang. And, mm -hmm. you know, they have this work on um, uh, that sort of relates K theory. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I, my dream would be that all that kind of stuff is actually some kind of intersection theory in the kind of algebra geometric world that I'm talking about. But I mean, we're very far from being able to define like turn classes of vector bundles in this context. What we could do is something simple, like if you take a, a polynomial in one variable, we can define what um, the multiplicities of the roots are, which is over any pasture, which sounds silly, but I mean, you don't have unique factorization anymore. So it's slightly non-trivial to do this. And then um, once that's just like basically defining, you know, for zero dimensional schemes, what are the, you know, kind of multiplicities of points, which you need for intersection theory. And uh, turns out that special cases of that construction over the sign hyperfield, this basically gives you Descartes rule of signs. And over the tropical hyperfield, this gives you the theory of Newton polygons. So um, somehow various classical constructions about polynomials are encoded in this kind of really elementary intersection theory. What we'd like to do is have things like uh, Bernstein's theorem on, um, you know, relating um, Newton polytopes um, and sparse systems of polynomial equations to counting solutions. This should also be a special case just for the Krasner hyperfield of, mm. of some kind of intersection theory. I have a student working on that, but it's kind of hard. I don't know. Some of the things you would like to do don't work in an obvious way and one has to make a bunch of detours. Yeah, I mean, one also, I mean, going back to the signed hyperfield, there's this, uh, I mean, there's also still the open question about the topology of the Meccasonian. Uh, right. I mean, does this somehow, I mean, does, do you think somehow some closer geometric understanding of, of pastures might help there? I mean, I don't, actually. Yeah, that's been another, another dream of ours. Um, you know, one thing this at least lets you do is um, give rather 
um, nice analogies between tropical things or if you like Berkovich space things which have to do with the tropical hyperfield to um, things over the sine hyperfield. And in the Berkovich world, you have these very nice results that tell you that um, the homotopy type of certain spaces is that of a, a nice polyhedral complex constructed as a skeleton. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so if you sort of replace tropical hyperfield by the sine hyperfield and you try to do similar things, in theory, that could settle some of these open problems about um, the topology of spaces of oriented matroids. Uh, but yeah, we haven't really found the tools to uh, analyze, really define those skeleta and analyze them in the same way one does in um, non-Archimedean geometry. So, you know, I think that's still an open problem. Okay, I have some more questions about resolution of singularities, but maybe you can, because time is limited, someone else should. Uh... Yeah, so if someone else still has a question. If not, then I guess, Matt, you can say whether you have to leave or whether you still want to hear Karim's other questions. Yeah, I mean, I would love to stay and chat, but we do, uh, we have a job talk that's going on right now that I should probably okay. attend. So maybe I'll- In that case, now. let's not keep you here much longer. So thanks again for the talk and I will stop the recording now. <laughs>